morning. Good to see uh, everyone out here this morning. Just a beautiful, beautiful day to come in South Florida together to worship the Lord. And uh, he's worthy to be worshiped this morning. He's any day, but it's wonderful to collectively come together and lift our hearts and to praise him and to thank him, to magnify him, but then also just to sit in his presence, to sit at his feet. And I'm aware, as well as you are, that there's a multitude of people around us. Some are here, some are not here. But uh, there's a lot of hurt, there's a lot of need in our body of Christ, and, and extended beyond that, just God needs to help and undertake. The hurts are real, but uh, I'm glad that as we come together, that God is able to meet our needs and help us and strengthen us and do what only He can. And so it's to Him that we worship, it's to Him that we go to and run to today. And so would you uh, bow your heads with us and let's invite the Lord's presence once again. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence one more time asking that God, that you would just make yourself known to us today. Dear Lord, you know the needs, you know the, the hurts, you know the concerns, you know the reports that have been given, and dear Lord, the diagnosis that has been shared. And, and Lord, you know all about those things today, and many, many minds are and hearts are heavy with some of that information today, but we pray, Lord, that you would just come, and you would help, and you would heal, and you would speak, and encourage, and strengthen today like a way that only you can. And so, Lord, as you would help, and as you would be uh, front and center of all that is said and done today, dear Lord, we will thank you and praise you uh, for the help that you give. We ask for it today. We need it today. And Lord, we'll give you praise for it today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you're ready to sing, sing. If you're not ready to sing, get ready as Glenn comes to lead us.
seated. You may be seated. We're going to sing the chorus of hiding in thee. With a firm foundation, we can hide in Jesus. Let's sing this just simple chorus. Amen. reminded of another song that came to my mind early this morning that there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God a place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God there is a place of comfort sweet a place where we, our Savior, meet near to the heart of God. And then that third verse says, a place, there is a place of sweet release. So as we come to prayer this morning, we come to a place of quiet rest and sweet release. What a wonderful place to be this morning to join in prayer with one another. We've come from a week of work and sometimes turmoil and difficulties. We had someone testify in our life group this morning of just so thrilled to come to the house of God to join together. What a wonderful privilege we have as we come near to the heart of God and we come from time of, of, of releasing our anxieties and our cares to him this morning. What a wonderful privilege. There are just so many needs. But we have him that we come to and we're releasing them to him. We're casting them on him this morning. And as we pray, let's remember the request for prayer. I, we, I just want to give God praise this morning for, for his work in John Chambers' we, life. We, we've requested prayer so many times for John over the last, last months. But John has been moved from a hospital to rehab. And just saying those words, I had... My faith was weak. I had no idea to ever say those words. So we give God praise this morning for, for that. But continue to remember him. As we pray, remember Janelle Keaton, who is in a home hospice care. Sherilyn Marshall's at home with hospice care. Nathan Bryant, so many of you know Nathan and Amy Bryant. Nathan has been diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. And so let's remember um, him this morning also. Robert Booth was taken to the hospital this morning 
Um, and so let's do pray for him, stroke-like symptoms, um, those kind of things. But let's do remember um, Robert in prayer. Let's remember um, Pat. Pat Mills is here, is, is suffering from, from depression. And let's, I trust that we do continue to pray for, um, for Pat. Sister Pierpoint had a, had a hospital stay and is at home recovering for the recovery now. Um, John Weaver was taken to the hospital this morning. Um, so it just seems like it, it doesn't hardly end. Uh, but, but remember John, he does need our prayers this morning. We don't have a real update on that. But, um, and then there's a Russell Osberg that um, is a client of of the Morgans over at A1 Auto. And, and, and Dave and Brandon and the crew over there have, have told them that we would pray um, for him. He has pulmonary fibrosis. So let's be faithful in praying for these. Merle Troyer is recovering. A former pastor of the church here is recovering from a light stroke. Um, Aaron Hamilton, we thank the Lord for a successful surgery. He is recovering down at uh, Cleveland Clinic in Weston, and so let's do continue to pray for him um, and others with cancer needs, uh, other needs, the Leesburg Bike Week. Um, uh, Justin Ellison is preaching in Kissimmee this morning. President Martin is in Turkey, and let's, let's do remember him. Um, um, a request has come in for Andrew Graham's father, Jim Graham. Many of you know him, has a has an urgent physical need. Let's remember um, Jim also this morning. Just so many things. There are those that are worshiping with us online that have needs and family needs and concerns. Uh, but our God is not limited. Praise God. Do you have confidence in him today? We're resting in him. We're releasing to him the great God of the universe. So I'm going to ask you to stand, if you would, and as Brother Joel comes to pray for us this morning. Let's all lift our voice to the Lord. Bring your needs. Cast your care on him. Release them to him. Praise his name. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come in prayer. And while I realize that I may be leading in prayer, I am reminded once again this morning that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is truly leading in the intercession for the needs that are represented in our congregation. Lord, in moments when we, we hardly know how to pray and when situations seem to overwhelm, we are reminded and, and just blessed by the thought that we serve a God that is interceding on our behalf, that cares deeply about what's going on. And we come in praise and worship to that God today. We do bring our needs, but Lord, we come in worship and praise, thanking you so much for, as we look back on the past, the ways in t which time and time and time again you've come, you've met with us, you've worked, you've answered prayers, you've met needs. And Lord, we don't want to fail to praise you. We, we come, as your word says, we come with thanksgiving before the God of the universe today. But we do come bringing this, this host of needs to you. Lord, you see each one. You know those that are, that are, are have kind of been taken by surprise by physical needs and are, are in the hospital today and, and going through situations and wondering uh, and, and not having answers to the questions that might be there and, and wondering what they're going to do about the future, wondering what's going to happen tomorrow, wondering how to deal with this and what to do. And Lord, I pray that you would just slip into those hospital rooms today, even of ones that I don't know about and, and in the rooms of the one that may not even be in the hospital that, but is just facing physical needs and feels alone today. Maybe even one sitting here in this congregation. And would you come alongside and would you remind that as us that as we look to you, you are capable uh, completely and totally of meeting needs and giving the encouragement, the help, the strength, the answers at times when, when you choose to give that. But even in moments when you don't choose to give those answers, the, the help and the strength and the encouragement that is so desperately needed. Be with the families of those that are struggling physically. Would you give them the encouragement and the help, the strength, the support and go? come alongside. Lord, we're just bringing these before you. 
We think of those that are ministering and and preaching in in different places today. Uh, President Martin in Turkey, Justin Ellison in Kissimmee, and many others that go from this church in different ministry opportunities. I pray that you would give special strength and encouragement to them today as they do their best to minister. Would your Holy Spirit come alongside them? We pray for Pastor Matt as he preaches even this morning. Would you anoint him with your Holy Spirit and presence? And would you speak your word in this church? And would your word go out from this church through these people into our community and into our world to to people that desperately need you. Lord, as as we have mentioned and we realize that each person comes with different needs on their hearts today to this to this service. And Lord, we simply want for the Holy Spirit to meet with us and for your work to be done in us and through us today. And as we come, we simply bring our needs before the Father. We lay them at your feet and say, God, whatever it is, whether it's physical, emotional, spiritual. Lord, I was reading again and reminded once again that Jesus Christ said that he has come to seek and to save those that are lost. And Lord, we realize that there are lost people. Maybe even in this service this morning, we come just just asking that you would seek out and save and work and move as only you are able to do. Lord, we give this service to you. We ask that you would be honored in it. In the offering that is about to be taken, would you use it for the furtherance of your kingdom? Would you bless it? Help us to give with giving hearts. And and would you take it and use it to do what you would have with it? Lord, bless the offering be in the remainder of this service for what you do we'll give you all the praise amen you may be seated so much for your giving and that wonderful uh, offertory this morning. I'm going to give you just a couple of announcements before we take some time in fellowship. Uh, tomorrow is uh, a different day here at Hope Sound. We're going to have 
the carpet's clean. Isn't that exciting to hear about on a Sunday morning? But the reason you need to know about that is because tomorrow, uh, after 9.30 classes are done in the tea hall, the tea hall will be closed for the rest of the day as they are shampooing and cleaning the carpets upstairs and downstairs. And so uh, that'll be needing time to, to dry and throughout the day. And then tomorrow morning after the, the chapel service and the activities here close right after chapel, 10.30ish, uh, uh, the CEC and uh, the lobby will be closed because all of these carpets will be also being cleaned tomorrow. So just keep in mind, after 10.30, uh, plan to go fly a kite or do something different, uh, but uh, just understand that these, these buildings right here, facilities will be closed for that purpose. Ladies' Banquet is on May 11th. We hope that you're planning to be part of that. And uh, Monday through Friday through the campus office or the church, tickets can be purchased for that. And I uh, hope you're marking uh, your calendar to be here uh, for that time, ladies. And then also, uh, we have mentioned on a couple of different occasions that we are raising money for uh, Joanna Stratton and uh, the need there uh, because of, of some of her ongoing physical needs, that turns into something else, into something else, and she's uh, having to, to have all of her teeth extracted and implants put in, and uh, that does not uh, come under their insurance policy. Uh, you know the story about that. So nonetheless, uh, the school school and the church have committed to raising that money. And uh, so just want to let you know that next Sunday morning, we're going to take a special offering for that cause right here at Hope Sound Bible Church. So be thinking about it. If you haven't given and you would like to give, um, you could give in that offering. And uh, the ball is already rolling. They're already starting the process and uh, dates are scheduled. And so at that time, uh, they're wanting to be able to uh, the, the options were we told them to let them know that we'd be paying the bill in full at that time. And so uh, if you are wanting to give in that, you can give in the offering on Sunday. You can stop by the church office anytime other than tomorrow uh, after 1030. Uh, you can stop in Tuesday through Friday and give if you'd like to. If you give online, hopesoundbiblechurch.com and the giving tab uh, in the memo, just put Stratton's so that we know that that is where it is going. And so uh, mark your checks accordingly. So that'll be next week. Just want to give you that little bit of information and uh, many have given already and from the church's perspective I think already to this point we're we're close to around the $15,000 mark and uh, so we're we're wanting to get a little over 20 from a church's perspective and so uh, if you're able to give next week it would be greatly appreciated it's so good to have each one of you here and uh, today it's good to have Greg and Trudy Onus first time visitors welcome to Hope Sound Bible Church and uh, we hope that you feel welcome today as our guest, and then also Todd and Annette Burns visiting with Frank and Marilyn Vaughn. Welcome. We're glad that you're here, and uh, a host of others. If, if, if you're here first time or visitor, we missed you, not on purpose. If you're a guest for any other reason, we're glad that you're here, and I understand that there are some, this is their last Sunday, heading back north. Uh, let's, let's be praying for those that are continually heading back. We'll be missing them, and we hope there's not a whole lot of time between the time they leave and the time they come back. So good to have all of our snowbird northerner friends down here uh, along the way. We enjoy worshiping together and being part of the family. Let's stand together and uh, let's shake hands with each other and uh, welcome each other into God's house this morning.
<laughs> well, over the next few weeks, uh, Glenn Alexander and Brandon Mills are are filling in, or if you want to call it, or temporary, how, whatever the terminology is, they are doing our music, and they're doing a great job. If you agree with that, say amen. And this morning, uh, they are, uh, Jerry Glick scheduled this already, so they didn't put themselves on the schedule, but uh, they're going to give us a, a, a bass duet this morning, and uh, let's worship with them as they sing.
Oh, how I love him. How I adore him. I love that song, but I love the words specifically that state that my creator, the creator, became my savior. Hallelujah. Wow, just a mind-blowing thought, but I'm glad it's a reality. Hallelujah. For whosoever will. If you have your Bibles, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, very familiar passage of Scripture this morning, but I could not get away from these thoughts and uh, been going over and over in my mind and just, uh, I don't know how it's going to come across this morning, but I'll just tell you I had a wonderful time and a joy putting it together and studying and, and uh, so I hope that you feel uh, the excitement that comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 that simply says, no temptation <clears throat> has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation he will also provide the way of escape that you might be able to endure it. <clears throat> We're going to give a little bit of background leading up to this passage of Scripture. God desires each and every one of us in this place today and beyond to be forgiven of our sins being raised from death to life. These things can and do happen whenever a person puts their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior by confessing and repenting of their sins. This event or this life-altering experience, if you will, is called salvation. The glorious transformation happens only when we as individuals activate our faith. Activate our faith, believing that we are who scriptures tell us we are. We are sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that he is who he says he is, which is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has come to take away the sins of the world. John chapter 14 verse 16 says uh, that the only way to God the Father is through his Son, Jesus Christ. He said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's just clearly played out in Scripture on many occasions in many Scriptures that the only way that we can come to the Father, the only way we can be reconciled, the only way we can be redeemed is through putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace that you have been saved. What? Through faith. It's not from ourselves, it's the gift of God, lest any one of us, any one of us would ever think that we could boast. We are saved by grace through faith. Before an individual can enjoy the beauty of forgiveness and a new life in Christ, they must first believe, and believing, ladies and gentlemen, takes faith. You ask the question, then what is faith? Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. The definition of faith contains two important aspects. There is, first of all, the intellectual agreement, and then there is trust. You see, this intellectual agreement is believing something to be true. Trust is then actually relying on the fact that that something is true. Now, we've all, we've all understood this analogy. It's been shared a hundred times or more. A chair is often used to illustrate this. The intellectual assessment, the agreement is recognizing that the chair is a chair and agreeing that this piece of furniture was created for individuals like ourselves to sit on. That is intellectual agreement and saying, this is a chair. This is what is made. This is how it's made. And I'm not supposed to move, probably. This is, this is a chair that is uh, uh, made for the specific person. But trust is then sitting down in that chair and believing that it's going to do what it says it's going to do. Understanding these two aspects of faith, I believe, is absolutely crucial. Many people believe specific facts about Jesus Christ. And there are a multitude who would intellectually agree with the facts that the Bible declares about Jesus Christ. 
But I'm here to remind us this morning that knowing those facts to be true is not what the Bible is meaning by faith alone. The biblical definition of faith requires both the intellectual agreement about who Jesus is and what he has come to do and what he will do, and then also trusting those facts and saying that if I will come to him, he will forgive me, he will cleanse my heart, he will give me strength, he will give me new life. It is simply agreeing intellectually that this is truth, and then sitting in the chair, so to speak, and saying, God. I confess my sins. I'm repenting of my sins. And if you'll forgive me, I'll serve you. It's sitting in the chair. It is what we call salvation, being saved by grace through faith. Believing that Jesus is is God incarnate who died on the cross to pay the penalty of our sins and is resurrected is not enough simply just to believe those facts intellectually. The Bible says in James chapter 2, 19 that even the demons believe these facts alone. But we must then personally and fully rely on the death of Christ as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. We must sit in the chair of salvation that Jesus Christ has has provided. Friends, when we do this, it's what we call saving faith. We are saved by grace through faith, believing the truth of God's Word and then sitting in the chair by trusting Him to do what He says He will do. Where are we going with this? I'm getting there. The biblical definition of faith does not apply just to salvation. You understand that? It is equally applicable to the rest of our Christian life. We are to believe what the Bible says, and then we're to obey it. We are to believe in God's promises, and then we're to live accordingly. We are to agree that the truth of God's Word, all of it, and then allow ourselves to be transformed by it, as we tried to talk a little bit last week in Romans chapter 12. Why is getting the definition of faith so important why must we trust accompanying agree and and, uh, trust accompanying that with agreeing with facts because hebrews 11 6 says this that without faith it is impossible to please god without faith we cannot be saved and without faith the christian life cannot be lived the way that god intended it to be lived faith is absolutely important for us to get its understanding the understanding of it if becoming a christian a child of god is through faith then staying a christian and being kept in the faith living in victory also involves faith so i'm getting there we're saved by faith and friends we are kept by faith In the early years of my spiritual journey, I struggled tremendously staying in victory. I'm not talking to to a group of people who are looking at me like, I never had that problem. I'm talking to a group of people who probably had that same problem. Most generally, got gotten saved, you'd gotten saved, and you were, you were wanting to serve the Lord, but you stumbled and you fell. And in my case, I was up and down and in and out more often than, than, I, than I want to admit or to talk about. And I was in that case so often that I, I almost, I almost gave up hope. I wanted to be a Christian down in the very depths of my heart. I wanted to be a Christian But it never failed sooner, more often than later. Temptations would come my way, and I would give in. And I found myself failing once again. Could I I ask for some honesty this morning? Is there anyone else that ever struggled in that place besides me? After wallowing in my guilt and shame for a little while, I would run back to Jesus, confess my sins, and Christ in his mercy would forgive me. I'm thankful this morning a thousand times over that God is gracious. He's rich in mercy. He's patient. Man, if he would have had a limit on that, I would have been sunk because I would have went well beyond that level of mercy and and graciousness. But I'm so thankful for a God who is faithful. 
Many here have heard my testimony of my former addiction to pornography. I'm not proud of it. It's nothing that gives me uh, just excitement to stand in front of a group of people and even worldwide and say, that was me. It's embarrassing. It was stupid. But I'll just say to you, to some people, it's cocaine, nicotine, and alcohol. To me, it was pornography. Like any other addict, I wanted deliverance, but I could not seem to find it. I tried several accountability partners. I downloaded different uh, uh, mechanisms, uh, mechanisms, excuse me, on my devices, made millions of promises, but I'm here to tell you nothing seemed to work. Then came that glorious moment when God spoke to me one day when I was lamenting my failure again. It wasn't always in the realm of uh, of pornography. I, I, was, uh, I, I loved movies. Man, I could sit and watch 24 hours worth of movies. And, and to be honest with you, they were movies that had nothing uh, pornographic in nature at all. But, but man, F-bomb 150 times in an hour and a half movie and God's name was, was taken in vain. I mean, just multitudes of times. I, I, just, I would just feast on that stuff. I knew God didn't want that in my life, and God would save me, and I would find myself slipping back, and I'd go right back in, tempted to watch that movie, and a new movie come out, and I'd, and I, no, I shouldn't, but I'd give in to that temptation, and immediately I knew I wasn't supposed to be, I knew I should have turned it off, and God in His faithfulness gave me a thousand reasons why I should turn it off and could turn it off, but I overrode it. And when the movie was over, I couldn't sit there and say, oh, whew, that was a close one. I knew that I had failed God. And Lord, here I am. I'm sorry I didn't. That was my life. But in that moment when I was lamenting my failure again, I was pouring out my frustrations to God. And no one else I know asked these questions, but I was asking questions like, God, can I really be delivered from all of this stupidity? Lord, have I messed up too often that you can't fix me? These were questions that I was asking God. And it was in this moment of, of, of lamenting that I felt God spoke to me, Matt Ellison. And what he opened my eyes to was life-changing. It wasn't anything new or earth-shattering. So when I share this with you, you're going to think, oh, wow, that was anticlimactic. But it was something that Matt Ellison needed to hear. And here's when I was praying, feeling like there was no hope. Listen, I believed with all of my heart, Brother Whippo, I believed with all of my heart that if I went back to God, I would confess my sins. He would forgive me. I believed that without question. I had faith that he would. But it felt like God just turned on a little light in my brain that simply said this, the same faith that it takes to be forgiven is the same faith you need to live in victory. I know that's profound. I know all of you are, are writing this down because it's, it's a good title for another book. I know it's just going to be groundbreaking things. But the reality of it is, ladies and gentlemen, the faith that I needed to believe that Jesus Christ could forgive me of my sins is the same faith that I needed to know that that same God could keep me day by day in my walk with Christ. As I said and I contemplated that thought, light flooded my heart and my mind and I've never been the same since. From that moment, as I have shared my story of up and down and, and bondage to the sins that I was enslaved to, that besetting sin uh, as well, there has, there has come with it a joy to be able to share that story. Not because I'm proud of it, but simply because I know that Jesus Christ has not only forgiven me of my sins, but he has helped me through faith to live in victory in Christ Jesus. I've been asked a hundred times, literally, of what plan that I followed? What system did you put in place to be delivered that you can finally have a testimony of living in victory? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you something. We don't have to live in a testimony of defeat. He is a God of victory, and he can give us victory in our life over the things that the devil wants us to think there's no hope in your life over. 
He can. And it's not by arrogance or cockiness that I can stand and say, oh, this, no, it's because of the grace of God and the faithfulness of God and a faith inside of my heart that says, Jesus, if you could forgive me, you can keep me. My answer, I'm afraid, has been disappointing to many because they were expecting a five-point plan to follow. But the answer is much more straightforward and simple. Deliverance and victory came in realness in my life through faith. This morning, I'm here to tell you there's victory for every single person in this room. I'm not the only one who struggled with up and down and in and out in the spiritual life. Many others have been there. Some of you might still be there this morning. But the answer to our dilemma in this, in this area, in this realm is the same. It will be conquered through faith in Jesus Christ. Just as it's not enough to intellectually agree that Jesus can save us from our sins, it's not adequate that we simply and intellectually agree that Jesus can keep us from our sin in this sinful world in which we live. For this to work, we must sit in the chair, so to speak. We must say by faith, Lord, I believe you can. And when temptations come into our life, we must sit in the chair again and say, Lord, I believe, I have faith that you can help me through this hour that I'm facing. We must believe that Jesus can and will forgive and act on that belief. Pray for repentance. We must also believe that Jesus has the power over the devil and sin. And then we must act on that belief and consciously rest and rely on his power that he will give us the strength and the victory in our lives when those moments of temptation come. Friends, this God that we serve, the creator that became our savior, is one of victory and power. And friends, it all depends on our faith in him either we believe that he can or we believe that he can't the decisions that we make in those moments of temptation will prove whether our faith is genuine and strong or whether it is weak and faulty in his book creation creators of ha creatures of habit steve poe writes this illustration when I was in grade school, several neighborhood kids walked to and from school each day. We walked down a street where a man had a large dog. It was a boxer. I had a very it had a very intimidating bark, and it was tethered to a long chain in the backyard. And when we walked past this house, that dog would start barking and run after us. Of course, the chain would eventually stop him, but we are always worried that it would break loose and attack us one day. I would start worrying about that dog blocks before we reached the house. One day, the dog's owner was in the yard, and he watched this entire scene unfold. The next day, as we walked by the house, the man was once again outside, only this time he had the dog on a leash. And when he saw us, he motioned for us to come over to him. We didn't know if we were in trouble or if he was going to let the dog come at us, attack us, or bite us, but either way, we weren't walking to him. Then he started walking towards us. And the entire time, the man kept saying to us, calming our fears, you don't need to be afraid of my dog. You don't need to be afraid of my dog. You don't need to be afraid of my dog. Then he knelt when he got to us, and he pulled back the dog's upper lip to reveal that his dog had no teeth. Seriously, not a tooth in that dog's mouth. The man said, if this dog ever did get loose and tried to bite you, it could not hurt you. And all of us started to laugh. And we were never afraid of that dog again. And when the man told us the truth, our fears, our worries about that dog were instantly gone. Ladies and gentlemen, can I remind us this morning that the most common tool in the devil's toolbox is to lie to us and to whisper in our ears that we can never break free from the power of sin. He is consistent in putting before us the things that that we're missing out on if we follow Jesus. He does an excellent job in convincing us that we'll never survive in this world as a Christian. We'll never thrive nor succeed if we follow Christ. He's told every person here, I'm sure, that the consequences of sin are not as bad as everyone says they are. And, and he's often told us that if we get into sin, we can quit and get out any time that we want to. His tool is effective because today, many are cowering in fear, living a life of failure, never able to break free 
free from their sinful habits, but I need to remind someone this morning that the devil is like the old dog in Steve Poe's book. He might growl and bark and sound ferocious, look mean, but listen, because of Calvary and an empty tomb, God has got rid of all of the devil's teeth. Because we serve a risen Savior this morning, sin no longer has control over us. We can, by God's grace, live victorious through our faith in Jesus Christ. But the choice is ours. Will we just intellectually agree that Jesus is able to help us live a victorious life over sin? Or will we sit in the seat and activate our faith and allow God to help us to live in victory? And those moments of temptation come. I'll pause here. It's not in my notes, but I'll pause just to, just to say this. Ladies and gentlemen, the temptations that the devil brings in our life is not always connected to that besetting sin. It's not always connected to lying or cheating. Ladies and gentlemen, the devil will do anything and everything he can to tempt us to do anything to pull us away in little bits and pieces away from the heart of God. More than likely, he's not going to come to me today and, and tempt me to do something that God saved me from. More than likely, little by little by little, he's whittling away, whittling away, whittling away, whittling away, and whittling away, and whittling away until the weakness is so real that in the moment of weakness, failure happens. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the choice is ours. Do we believe God can? Are we here this morning? Do you believe that God is able to save you from your sins? Say amen. amen. Do you believe that God is able to keep you from falling in the realm of temptation? Say amen. amen. Then it's time that we sit in the seat, not just intellectually agree with it, but sit in the seat when temptation comes and say, Lord, I'm trusting you. Trusting you. Our text sheds some encouraging and helpful truths about this victorious leaving, and so that was my introduction. And I have a few points I want to share. They're short, but I wanted just to let you know that because I'm prepping you. I'm prepping you. You don't understand this, but Brother Paul Stetler's preaching tonight. So I'm just prepping you. You know, this is kind of what you're in for this evening. In this passage of Scripture, in, this, in this, this truth that we're looking at, I want us to notice something. Our first slide says this, God does not tempt anyone. All right? We need to understand that. In our living a life of victory, we need to understand that God does not tempt anyone. God will allow temptations to come into our lives, but the temptation is always, always from the enemy of our soul. This truth is important because when you can identify the source of something, it can often empower a person in their response. When you know where something is coming from, it can help you tremendously in your response. If I know someone hates me or strongly dislikes me and is endeavoring to destroy everything about me, my response to their taunting, their threats, and tirades will be maybe to brush them off, shake my head at their attempts, or maybe even with a little aggression respond. Why? Because I know the source. I know the reason behind their comments, their accusations. I can see through their facade of kindness in front of people and their, their devilishness behind the scene. They're out to hurt. They're out to destroy. And when you know the source, it has a way of helping you to respond in the right way. But if I know that the sense of criticism or suggestion or leadership is coming from a friend or someone who really cares, someone who doesn't want me to fail, my response then would be to listen, to consider, perhaps if it felt to, to follow that leadership. Why? Because you know the source. They've proven themselves to be, I guess if we could say it this way, in my corner. They're rooting for you. They're encouraging you. They're, they're, they're cheering you on. And ladies and gentlemen, in our natural setting, we gravitate towards those who cheer us on and distance ourselves from those who want us to fail. Why? Because we know the source. You say, what in the world does this have to do with, with this point? The, the reality is God never tempts anyone to evil. 
And so when we can recognize that every temptation that comes in our life is from the very pits of hell, it should help us in our response towards that temptation. It's not for your good or my good. never is. James 1, 13 and 14 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Here, we're reminded that any temptation present in our lives is from the enemy of our soul, the one, the devil, who John 10.10 says he has desired to come and steal, to kill and destroy, to steal the joy from us, to kill us spiritually and to destroy our soul. This is the one that is entering temptation into your life. God is allowing temptation in your life. It's not coming from him, but it is coming from the enemy of your soul. Temptation always has a negative connotation. From a chocolate candy to cold soda, a bag of chips, a cigarette, a bottle of whiskey, a lie, a lustful lifestyle. Friends, they're all unhealthy and harmful. Remember where temptations come from if you want to to take the steps to live a victorious spiritual life. The source of temptation, of evil, is from the devil himself, the one who hates God so much that he will do anything and stop at nothing to see us destroyed. But secondly, I want us to notice in this realm of of victorious living that victorious living requires our efforts. I know this might cause someone to to chafe a little immediately and and argue, listen, uh, we don't believe in this uh, this works-driven religion. I don't either, but let me remind you, I firmly believe that I'm not saved by works, nor am I kept by my works, but the Scripture does teach us that faith without works is dead. Our efforts in walking in obedience and victory and victory in a victorious Christian life is twofold. There has to be a conscious decision on our part, and then there has to be a willingness to walk in obedience to that which we know. The conscious decision, when temptation presents itself to you or to me, we cannot remain idle. There is no idleness. If we know what truth is, friends, we have two choices. We're either going to immediately say, Lord, by your help and grace, I'm going to walk in that obedience. Or if we become idle, that slips right into disobedience. Friends, there has to be a conscious decision in us that simply says, on my part, and the effort from Matt Ellison when temptation is in my life. I know what I should do. I know what truth is, and I'm going to be obedient to that. And therefore, I'm going to make some conscious decisions that I'm going to put me square in face of obedience to what I know is right. Joseph, when he was tempted by his master's beautiful, sexy, and seductive wife, who was aggressively pursuing an ungodly relationship with him, fled the house when he found himself alone with her and her aggressive come-ons. He didn't stick around. He didn't kind of wait around to kind of see how this played. He didn't allow his ego to get built up and think, wow, this seductive, beautiful woman, my master's wife, is making some advances at me. He didn't stick around. The Scripture says when it was there in the moment, he fled from it. What is that? That is a conscious decision to walk in obedience. I know that I know the New Testament wasn't around then, but the principles of God's word were. And 1 Corinthians 6 18 says that we ought to flee. You get that? Flee from sexual immorality. Flee from it. We naturally flee from danger. When a building catches fire, guess what? We flee to a safer place. We live in South Florida, and when a hurricane is about to make landfall and it's of any significance, get what do you do? We flee the coast. Some people flee it a whole lot quicker, but before they even get one one whiff of wind, man, a hurricane's coming three months from now, and they're already in Tallahassee making their way to somewhere. Unfortunately, when many people see temptation coming, they don't flee. 
Rather than flee temptation, they dabble in, deflect, postpone, they analyze, maybe even embrace it. And could this be because most people do not recognize the danger inherent in temptation? We are more concerned with physical dangers that threaten the body than spiritual dangers that threaten the soul. Friends, when temptation comes our way, we need to make a conscious decision. I'm going to flee. I'm going to run. Romans 13, 14 says that we ought to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify these desires. You know what that is? That's making a conscious decision that I'm going to walk in obedience. I'm going to make no provision. of the Making provision for the flesh, flesh is opposite. I mean, just polar opposite of fleeing temptation. We make provision for the flesh when we accommodate the things that lead to sin. And, and when we do that, friends, whether you realize it or not, when you don't flee, when you don't make the conscious decision to walk away from the temptation the devil's bringing into your life, you are making preparations to sin. That's what you're doing. You're preparing the way to make it easy for you to sin. I'll go back to the illustration that I shared with, with, with movies. Man, I want to tell you something. If, if someone would be here, I, 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 I don't, and this is not a bragging thing, but, but you know, th those were the movies I watched. The music I listened to was awful, awful stuff. Ugh. Listen to it now, you're just embarrassed by, by hearing the tune, let alone the words. You're thinking, oh, my word, I listened to that. And I'm not talking about a little, I'm talking about bad. And when I fail, I went right back to that stuff. Listen, if you're having trouble with the things that you watch, why in the world are you even bringing television in your home? Amen? If you're having trouble with things you watch, why are you even bringing streaming devices into your home? If this is a constant point of failure for you, when you decide, I'm going to bring in that device, I'm going to bring in those streaming capabilities of Hulu, Netflix, whatever they are, whatever they may be for you, whatever it is, listen to me. What you're doing is you're making provision for, your, for the flesh. You should not be surprised that somewhere down the line, sooner or later, you're failing in the very area that you've always followed. Don't make provision for the flesh. Put on Christ that you might be able to live in victory. If it's a problem to you, flee from it. You say, well, so-and-so can. Well, so-and-so is so-and-so. You are you. If it's a problem, run from it, my friend. Make the conscious decision, no, and walk in obedience. You say, well, it doesn't say it in book, chapter, and verse. Who cares if God is being faithful to you and saying, there's your point, there's your problem. Run from it, my friend. I can't express it enough because if we're going to live in victory, the temptation doesn't come from God. It comes from the devil himself. And when we see our areas of weakness, we ought to make no provision for there to be a planning session to sin. We foolishly place confidence in the flesh when we allow ourselves to remain in tempting situations instead of fleeing from them. We believe the lie that our sinful flesh will somehow find strength to resist in that last moment. And then we are shocked and ashamed. Instead of resisting, we give in. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, God has the power to help us to live in victory. We don't have to be up and down and in and out. But understand, foundation is God doesn't tempt us. That's from the devil. And if we're going to live in victory, we are going to have to put forth the effort. Thirdly, we have to understand that our efforts in themselves are not enough. Yes, we must make the conscious decision. Yes, we must walk in obedience. But our own efforts are not enough. Our text says that he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with temptation he will also provide a way of escape that you will be able to endure it. What does that mean? That he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. I thought our ability is not enough. It's not enough. But listen to what the Scripture is saying. The Scripture is saying, I, I, love, I love the Bible because, you know, it supports itself all through. 
And we read in the Old Testament that God says to those who are following him, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I am with you. I'm going to be there for you. In the New Testament, we're reminded we have the Spirit with us. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He lives within us. And greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, all throughout Scripture, we are told that, that God is enough for everything in our life. And so what, uh, what 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is saying is this in this passage. He'll not let you be tempted beyond your ability. He's saying this simply. There's not a thing in this world that has the ability to have control over you that after you have done everything that you can do to stand, that the Holy Spirit is not going to make up the difference and help you to live the way that God wants you to live. If you have Christ in your heart uh, as your Savior and the Holy Spirit living within you, ladies and gentlemen, we can conquer every foe. It's not in ourselves, but it's through the Holy Spirit. It's not in ourselves, but it's through the power of the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing, there's no temptation that will be beyond our ability when we have the Holy Spirit abiding within Victorious living happens at the intersection of our conscious decisions to flee temptation and our dependency on the divine strength of the Holy Spirit. When those two intersections meet, friends, you will always find victory. Fourthly, if we're going to live a life of victory, God does not tempt his children. Victorious living requires our efforts, yes, but yet thirdly, our efforts are not enough. Fourthly, we need to understand that temptations serve a purpose. As mentioned, God does not tempt anyone, but he allows temptations in our lives. One might ask, why in the world would a good God allow temptation into the lives of his children? I believe the answer can be connected to the Garden of Eden. When God created the garden, it was perfect, it was pure. Then God created Adam and Eve, and he placed them in the garden, and inside of them they put a free will the ability to choose between right and wrong, good and evil. And in the garden, God placed two specific trees. You'll read there that he, he put in there the tree of life and he put in there the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There were a multitude of other trees, but there are these two specific trees that are named. And he said, listen, you can partake of every other tree. You can, you can partake of the tree of life. You can partake of all of them. But you cannot partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Wasn't God tempting them, you might ask? Wasn't he kind of setting them up? No, no, my friend, he was not. We've already established that God does not tempt us. But God allows temptations to come into our life. Again, you might ask why. I believe the answer is simple. I believe that temptations are a way that we can prove our loyalty and love to God. It would have been easy for Adam and Eve to proclaim their commitment and loyalty to God without any obstacles in their life. But given a choice, are you hearing this? But given a choice, a decision has to be made. I'm going to walk in obedience to God and I'm going to walk with Him or I'm going to give in to what I know I should not give in to. Would they follow the serpent's lies or by faith? Would they trust and obey their creator? Ladies and gentlemen, not a person here enjoys temptations. Not a one of us do. We all understand them to be driven by evil intentions, by the devil himself. We find them challenging. We find them annoying. Oh, how grand life would be without temptations. But a fresh look at temptations might do us some good. Maybe we should see the temptations as way to daily, yes, I say daily, prove our love and loyalty to Christ. It's easy for us to profess our love and loyalty to God without obstacles, but, but God wants this love and loyalty to flow from our will. He wants us to choose Him in the middle of a thousand other choices. He wants us to refuse the temporary pleasures of this world that we might enjoy the eternal riches of heaven. Like Daniel and his companions when they were taken into captivity, they refused to eat meat from the king's table. It was the best there was. It was the best of the best. The king ain't eaten from Aldi's. The king is 
eating from the best of the best. And they said, will not eat from his table. Why? Because to do so would have been a slap in the face of their God, the one true living God. Friends, God wants that same kind of commitment from us that when we have the choice of the best that this world has to offer, that we still say, by God's grace, I choose Jesus. I choose to put my faith in him. My commitment is to him. I love him and I'll be loyal to him. God does not tempt his children. Our musicians are coming. Victorious living requires our efforts. But we have to remind ourselves our efforts are not enough. But in the middle of this, we have to understand these temptations have a purpose. They're not just random things. God allows them. And it's through these temptations we have the ability to prove our love and loyalty to him. But having said all of that, I love our text that reminds us victory through faith can be found because God is faithful. God is faithful. Friends, God is aware of the awfulness of temptation. Remember Jesus, God in the flesh, was tempted in every way we are tempted. Hebrews 4.15 says, for we, do, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. He's not unable. No, but we have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are. Listen, yet without sin. Do you understand that? I'm aware that Jesus never faced temptation or at least it would seem this way, the logical thing, never tempt, faced the temptation in, in an inner sense per se, the way that we do, because he was never sinful in his nature, pulling us to sin from the inside. But ladies and gentlemen, he knew the strength and the fury of external temptation in a way and to a degree that we will never, never know. He knows what we go through and what we have gone through, he has faced worse. And because God knows what temptation is like and how brutal it can be and how harsh it can be, in those moments, he pushed them aside and sinned not. God is faithful. He is faithful in warning us, friends. If you just read the Word of God, listen to evangelistic services across the nation around the world, God is faithful to tell us of sin. God is faithful to check our spirits. You know, when the devil comes and, and brings a temptation of any form into our life, that uneasiness that we begin to feel in our spirit, that, that thing that's checking us and saying, stay away, run from it, get away from it, don't tarry here too long, put this behind you, that is the faithfulness of God saying, be careful, get away, run, flee. God is faithful. He's faithful to lead us along life's pathway. A path that is filled with traps and exit ramps from the holy way. God is faithful. But we can, through his faithfulness, through faith, live a victorious life. It simply means we must believe that God can and will do what he says he can and will do. And then we must sit in the chair. And say, Lord, I believe it. And so therefore, I'm going to make the conscious decision to do what's right. I'm going to walk in obedience to you. I'm going to trust that your strength is made perfect in my weakness. And then in your faithfulness, I'm going to let you lead me through this temptation victorious to the other side. Jude 1.24 says this. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. There's nothing that will bring greater joy to the heart of Jesus Christ than to be able to present you and me to the presence of his Father as a Christian living a life of victory over sin daily. Friends, I'm here just to remind us, 
we can have the victory in our spiritual walk. Do we ever have to? This, this might sound, oh, we're back. No. Are there ever times that God's going to speak to us that we have to get on our knees and say, Lord, here I am. I'm sorry. No, but I'm telling you, we don't have to intentionally go back to sin. God can keep us. And we can be a testimony 20 years down the road and say, faith is the victory. Amen. We're standing together this morning. And we're going to sing this chorus. Faith is the victory. And if there's anyone here this morning that says, you know what? I want to get on victory side. I need victory in my heart and my life. I need it. Why don't you come and pray and let us close out this morning and let you leave with victory in your heart. Let's sing it. All right. Overcomes the foe. White raiment shall be kept before the angels. He shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, for hearts with love of flame will vanquish all the hosts of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith thank you so much for this time of worship, a time of hearing God's word. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can overcome the temptations that come in our lives through victory, through faith. And Jesus, we pray a prayer of blessing on each one of these people that are here. There are hurting people, Lord, in this congregation today. Lord, there are those that are suffering, Lord. And I think of uh, my cousin Andrea Lee that passed away this morning suddenly. Father, be with her family, Lord, and just be with us and those that have lost loved ones, Lord, suddenly. We pray, Lord, that you'll bring comfort and healing. And Lord, just give us the strength that we need each and every day. Bring us back tonight, Lord, and help each one as they go their way. Father, in your name we ask it. Amen.